We care about these prairie systems because the prairie systems are really going to be the survival of us all. These prairie systems have been around a long time. They've been managed over long periods of time, thousands of years, by other ungulates, other animals, whether it was a camel way back when, or whether it was bison that we used to have. But these prairie systems are critical for sequestering carbon, for um, resisting global change and that's a very very important thing if we look at it compared to any type of cropping system we have and definitely we can all understand this when we go out and look at the beauty in some of these areas but these grassland prairies and these prairie systems are really the basis of us not only on diversity of wildlife species and food for us but it's for resisting climate change um, perennial grasses, perennial systems are the best system to keep us sustainable and keep us thriving into the future. My name is Steve Van Vliet. I'm the Washington State University Extension Specialist, Regional Extension Specialist, and we are here today at the Dalles Mountain Ranch area. And this is just up from the Dalles, Oregon, on uh, the Dalles Mountain Ranch Road. I got interested in this area um, because of some of the previous work I, I had done. I was originally raised in Colorado and on a fruit farm and got my bachelor's degree down in Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, and then my, went on later to do my master's at the University of Wyoming and in entomology and my doctorate in agronomy. And the reason we're up here today is because I got interested in a project up here just outside of the Dalles at the, at the ranch because the state park wanted to have some restoration, some management of some of their lands. It'd been sitting here since, I, like I say, it's been given to the park service, deeded over in 1993. So the lands had been sitting in rest for 23 years, something like that. So over that amount of time, issues started to arise. The grasses started to die, the grass, native grasses that were seeded. It was seeded to an area, and a lot of these pastures were seeded for livestock production. It was a working ranch at one time. And my father used to um, run cattle on this very piece of property years ago, and he grazed it and, um, over the years, and it was uh, very viable. Well, over the last few years, over actually the last 15 years, I've worked on a lot of land that sits in rest to manage that because some of that is the worst thing we can have. It sits dormant, it starts to decay, um, the grasses just start to oxidize because it's not being managed, it's not being grazed or taken care of. There's not the natural ecosystem processes that we used to have. I decided to come up here and see what the state parks was doing. So I asked them first, what are your objectives? What do you want to get out of this area? What do you want? If you want restoration, rehabilitation, do you want to have livestock back in there? And according to Pat that had deeded this land to the state parks, he wanted this to remain as a working ranch in some way, also maybe an education center. Well, it was wonderful. It's a great idea. And so the state parks had some of that in their own mind, but it's also a very highly visible area. Very, very beautiful. And a lot of individuals look at this area and say, you know, the livestock hasn't been here. This area is beautiful. And the reason it's beautiful is we don't have livestock. We don't have animals grazing on the area. Well, there's a misconception about grazing animals, and, and we will talk about that here today. What I want to do is have the Native Plant Society and the Friends of the Columbia Gorge and the people that come up here and view this beautiful area to be involved in this project. Well, when I first came up here, it was very, very interesting. I met with the people, and they, especially with some of the Native Plant Society, and they were actually not very happy with me. They said, I cannot believe you would even think of bringing livestock back into the, this, this Dallas Mountain Ranch because it 
livestock will destroy the area. I first heard about this project oh, six or seven years ago and at the time that I heard they were grazing cattle at the Dalles Mountain Ranch and that's where we're standing now I was infuriated because cattle have done a lot of damage to the prairies and the grasslands of the West. So I thought, why are these cattle grazing on public property when they've, they've pretty well damaged most of the, the prairies? Livestock is not considered a tool in a lot of people's minds because we have our own biases. So I wanted to work with the individuals and, and address their concerns. So I talked to them first about an area that I had done some research on that had, had showed 50 years of grazing, spring grazing compared to fall dormant season grazing, and the effects on wildflowers. And after I showed them to this and gave them the pictures and gave them the data about how you can do it in a managed way, their eyes opened. So we drew up a rehabilitation plan for the Dalles Mountain Ranch, which we're on. So we started developing this plan to say, okay, this is what we'll do. And the livestock I actually picked were cows. Cattle feed 70% primarily on grass. The other species of animals and livestock feed on other different species. They asked me, okay, could we use other tools? Because other tools are used in some of these things such as burning, such as some pesticides. You know, you can definitely use herbicides to control things, such as, um, mowing and also we do some revegetation and I said all of these are very good ideas some of them we have to be very careful especially burning here in a very very low rainfall area burning we could burn up the whole ranch and everybody's homes within a 200 mile radius in fact, I don't know where you could go within 300 miles of Portland to find a prairie uh, of, of a high quality what I discovered when I investigated it was that they were using the cattle as a tool for restoring the prairie lands here. So as one who's been passionately involved with restoration, particularly prairie restoration, I volunteered to participate coming from the environmental standpoint. The benefit that we have from these cattle is that they eat back and provide the disturbance that fires may have produced 200 years ago before European settlement. And then the next spring in 2010, in the spring of 2010, and looking at this, it, the recovery was amazing. And so I was so excited about it. And the Native Plant Society, they brought tours up and they had some people looking to see what the results were. And they were like, oh my gosh, we see so many more wildflowers. And some of the native species that you see are like arrow leaf balsam root. It's a yellow um, sunflower type plant out here and you also see lupin, beautiful um, lupin, you'll see penstemons, you'll see buckwheat, you'll see some, there's some rare flowers in certain areas and so we see a lot of these things, we saw, see a lot of lomatium and the lomatium had increased by 65 percent in just one year in some of these areas because we'd opened it up. We're even starting to see seedlings of arrowleaf balsam root, which takes a long time, and some, we saw some lupin come back into the area. So some of these seeds already existed there, so I was already seeing results after one year. But typically, we don't see in a grazing system results till about three years. We are actually getting an increase in diversity of plants. We are getting reduction in the amount of grass there and improving in the the actual protein and the health of the grasses that were there and how they came back and regeneration of those grasses. We saw protein increase tremendously in that. And the diversity of wildflowers was very important. So we're starting to get the diversity and what we wanted. It shows some of the impacts of this project. The people getting involved have been tremendously supportive. My name is Andrew Fielding. I work for Washington State Parks as a resource steward. I've been working with Steve Van Vliet for several years on the restoration project at Dallas Mountain Ranch and it's been a great partnership project where we've been able to get some restoration work achieved and Steve's been able to um, combine that with some of his research. So it's been the perfect project for us. We're seeing great results and um, the public are enthusiastic about it too.
We hope that uh, this has been uh, very valuable for the park system and we hope to maybe be able to expand it, use more grazing places around on the park and maybe for longer periods of time to, to help the grass growth. What is very dramatic is when you visit the site in the spring and you can see where cattle were grazing and where cattle have never grazed, it's a tremendous difference. Where cattle have grazed, the, the number of flowers is, is just phenomenal and the, and the grasslands are, are in great shape. Where the cattle have never grazed, it's just a thick thatch and there are very few, if any, wildflowers growing. Well, we see a lot more diversity. Some of the uh, cultivars that were planted originally by the, the farmers in the area are starting to reduce in number. We're seeing the balsam and lupin and many of the wildflowers that you see on the broader landscape um, come back into these old farming pastures. Um, and, and you can really tell the difference when you come here in the spring during the, the wildflower season. Uh, we're very restrictive as to which plants we bring back, which species. They need to be growing naturally within a few miles of the site. Uh, the rabbit brush is actually growing in a remote area on the property, so we know it was here before, so we feel comfortable about reintroducing it here. Uh, I think we planted eight rabbit brush last year year. We have a wonderful relationship with Milestone Nursery in Lyle. We go out and collect the seed. They grow the seed out for us. It's, they've been growing it now for a year. Since I've been using cattle, it's been a wonderful tool to restore this prairie area. Um, we see this year coming in a lot more green growth to it than we had, say, three years ago. Um, the, the, the dead dry stuff has been eaten down and it's gave way to more green and it just looks healthier. This is the best it's looked in the, in the last three years that we've been here. There have, have there been concerns? Of course there's been concerns. There's been concerns about still using livestock, still using cows as a tool. But we can, in a managed way, it can be a success for, both, for all of us not just the state parks, not just Washington State University, not just the Native Plant Society, but all of us, but also for the entire ecosystem. This is an ecosystem rehabilitation project. It's not the amount of animals, it's not the animals themselves that are out in these areas, it's the time that you have them out there. We have to look at the vegetation, we have to monitor the vegetation, and the plants, and the flowers, and even the wildlife. It's been amazing the amount of wildlife that's come back in here. In an area that has sit in decadent for 23 years plus, that has just not had the wildlife like it should. Yes, occasional deer will run through it, and they might lay down out there, but the grazing is not there. And, and the, the, the northern harriers that are out there now, the mount, we actually have some owls that are out there, and we'll find the pellets out there a lot, because they can go out there and they can actually find some of the voles. And so the wildlife has increased, the diversity has increased, instead of just having specific species. So overall, it's been a very, very productive project and not restricted to one specific objective and goal. It's been a group goal. The reason I was doing this prey ecosystem and really some of the motivation is we want to see the health, the health of an area. And when we have the loss, and when we have monocultures of agriculture crops or when we don't have our prairie systems that are managed correctly, like they used to be hundreds of years ago, we start losing bird species, we start losing insect species. I have an entomology background and I actually looked out here and looked at the invertebrate, po poly the invertebrate um, diversity. The diversity is improving. So why do we want these bird diversity and insect diversity and plant diversity? Is because it's the ecosystem that sustains life. And if we look at the collapse, to be honest, of civilizations, the collapse of things, it's because we have abused the soil. We don't have ground cover. We don't have diversity. And when we have losses of these different species and we're focused just on the economics of something, not economics, the entire sustainability, but economics, socially responsibility, 
environmental responsibility, if we don't st st focus on all of that, we have a collapsed ecosystem. And we have our, more or less, we have societies that will collapse. And this is what's happened over centuries ago because of the collapse of soil. So we need to have all the species in here. We need to have this diversity so that all of us can enjoy it and know that we live in a very, very healthy environment. Who funds these types of projects? And has this project been funded? Is probably a good question. So typically, these projects are funded by the government, um, sometimes the state, but a lot of times federal government to do these projects. But we have to all be passionate about what we do because we know that this is important for not myself, not just the Native Plant Society, not just the state parks, but really important to all of us to see the diversity, to see how we can recover these native prairie systems to make it beneficial to all of us, to all of us no matter where we live, so that we breathe healthier, so that we have food, so that we have birds and we enjoy the outdoors and enjoy these different systems. This project does have some problems and some downsides and I think most of it comes from us not having an open mind. It comes down to when it comes, it comes down to people and all of us are different. We all, like I say, we have our own biases and we have our own objectives and goals. And this project has had its trials and tribulations. Um, there's been individuals that have tried to stop this project because they say, no matter what, livestock should not be out on these lands and it's causing problems. But I just want to say to individuals, to people, to groups, no matter who it is, to myself at times, like we're all learning. And so we adapt and we try to make this project, this, these projects, this prairie type restoration, positive for all of us. You know, we don't want to impact the environment negatively at all because that only hurts us. That only makes this project a failure and we have enough failures. <laughs> I know I've talked a lot here about the, this prairie system and this area here above the Dalles, Oregon, and it's so beautiful and we're recovering this prairie, but it's not only an issue when it comes to the United States. This is also a critical issue when it comes to the world. I've done work in Moldova, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq, and all of these issues arise there. Mass production, agricultural areas, which we have to do, that's absolutely true to be able to sustain, but we've done it in ways that aren't sustainable which we've tilled the lands, we've cut down the trees, we've tilled up the, the prairies. This is at a global rate. It's, these prairie systems are disappearing at a global rate. I am actually working in a lot of these other countries now to actually repair that, to change some of our views and how we look at these systems so that we can get diversity and management. Not to take away agriculture, that's not the point. I work in agriculture all the time. But to do things, say, in direct seeding, in no-tilling, in allowing species companion cropping and all these different things to increase our diversity of not only the plants, our fruit and vegetables and cropping systems, but also the diversity of our animal, our wildlife, and our health the crops that we produce for our own health. Because I don't want to see the collapse like that has happened in some of these countries. And it has been. The soil is gone. They don't have any soil like we have here in the United States. They have had 5,000 years of erosion. We can be happy here in the United States, to be honest, because we only have 200 years. But to look at what we've done in 200 years, it's almost identical to what I see in Iraq and Afghanistan when it comes to soil loss. Can we recover? Mother Nature is beautiful. She's tough and she can recover. She can fix us. But leaving it in rest is not the answer. Management and doing all we can is, is the answer and using all the tools we have in the basket. We can't use just one specific tool and working with people 
you know, people like you that are out there, that is so important because it's the only way I have success. The only reason I can say that I have success is because I work with people like you, with the Native Plant Society, with individuals that are concerned about what's happening out there. The very interesting thing about this project is I talk about collaboration, I talk about working with people all the time, and it is so important. But we also work with different agencies. Goals and objectives are very different for agencies. It's very different for me. I'm also with the state, I'm the university, of, so with Washington State University, and we have our own goals and objectives. So it was difficult. It was difficult lining up a state park and Washington State University and the Native Plant Society to all work collaboratively. I've had many, many hoops to jump through. I've had people wanting to sue me over doing this type of restoration project. It has been a challenge and long nights. And even my wife at times, she will say, Steve, you can't worry about this. You can't worry about CRP lands that sit and rest all the time. You can't worry about the prairies. You know, you're not gonna change them all. You know what, I'm gonna change what I can change because I can do it. But I can only do it working with the people and the agencies, but the agencies are difficult. We have to jump through many, many hoops. But people are people. And I feel if I get a close working relationship with them, now I have a close working relationship with the state parks in Washington State. I even have a close working relationship with international countries, with their ministries of agriculture. Because I don't take no very easily. I actually have to visit with them and say, I have to meet the Minister of Agriculture. I want to tell him that we can do this if we work together. I do it with the Department of Ecology here in Washington State, with the Department of Environmental Quality in Oregon. It's, I have a talk pretty soon going out there with Oregon about these types of subjects because we all have to work together to make things a success. Many times, and you've even heard it here, but many times you've heard about sustainability. And I want to explain what sustainability is. Sustainability can be adapted. And sustainability can be a bad word at some times because it's changed with, people change what the meaning is. But sustainability is really, can it be carried on into future generations? That's one part of sustainability. Can your children keep farming agriculturally? Can they still keep producing crops? Can they still be working on the land? Carrying on, even if it's sowing. It doesn't have to be just prairies and those sorts of things. But can it be sustainable through generations to come? Also, it needs to be environmentally sound. It needs to consider the environment. Once we abuse our lands and abuse Mother Nature, that is not environmentally sustainable or that part of sustainability. So it's those two. It's also, it has to be economics. Yes, we have to make money. There has to be some money made so that we are able to live, not beyond our means, but within our means. So we have to make money, other people have to make money, but we can't have one be higher than the other. And it has to be socially responsible and socially acceptable. So if I'm doing something that is completely against society, then that is not necessarily sustainable. So all of these components make up what we call sustainable. And sustainable agriculture is in the agriculture side of things. But it can be within any other part of your life. It's important for us to manage our lands in a sustainable way and, and nudging them back towards that more native ecosystem helps us do that and reduces the management impact upon our, our park. When, when, it, when the vegetation's more native, it, it works better for um, the land here and, and reduces the amount of time we have to be in there dealing with noxious weeds and non-native vegetation. What is the future of this project? And what, you know, do I really want to stop this type of project? Wow, that's a hard thing to say, you know? Um, we all change so much. I've had a lot of different careers. So do I want the future of this project to end? No. Can I work on it forever? That's probably no too because I have, I pull myself in so many directions. Yeah, maybe I'm a workaholic or what they call a workaholic, but 
it's because I enjoy it and I want to go out there. I want to be at these other countries. I want to teach people. I want to work with people. I want to help us grow as a nation, as a, as a world, grow sustainably, as I've just talked about you, to you earlier. Probably one of the most surprising things when it comes to this project is the change that can happen quite suddenly. I really, and most of the work I've done in these systems of restoring prairie or working on managed grazing or working in agriculture production systems, the changes you don't see automatically, especially in grazing systems and prairie restoration. And after one year of grazing, a mob grazing type system where I evaluate the plants, the animal health, and look at the next year, it was amazing to me at looking at some of the transition and seeing the quality of the, not only the quality of the grasses that were coming back, but the amount of forbs and how quickly they could come back after sitting for so long. I never thought the plants were there in the soil. You know, some have blown in, yes, but a lot of those have been there. And luckily in this very, very dry climate, this is not like um, Western Washington or Western Oregon that gets more rainfall. It only gets about eight inches annual precipitation. The seeds will last a lot longer. So it was amazing the plants that came back up and were productive over a short period of time. When you look at a project like this in doing prairie restoration, is it easy? Is it difficult? It is extremely difficult because you have to use all these management tools that I've talked about. But if I look at what the success rate of this is and the projects I've overall done in riparian zones, in prairie restoration where you still have to provide water and, and work with people and do a collaborative, but working collaborative makes my success rate much higher. And so I have been, I can proudly say that my success rate is probably 85 to 90%. Do I have issues? Do I have problems? Do I have some areas where, uh-oh, I may have impacted this a little bit more than I want? Or I have to have a small sacrifice area because I do have to have the livestock they drink and they're gonna cause issues right around the watering tank. So I can't really say that that's a failure. It's still a success rate, but I have to adapt and manage that area differently than I do the entire area. So overall, I'm proud of what I do I'm excited about what I do and this this makes me even want to just run back out into the field and get working on it right again. This project has been a great triumph for me and I want to give thanks to the Native Plant Society, especially Bob Hansen, Barbara Robinson and the rest of the Native Plant Society that has helped with the restoration efforts and keep ongoing work with the restoration efforts here at the Dalles Mountain Ranch. Also to the state parks, Washington State Parks, for allowing us to change in their objectives and goals and to allow us to work on a restoration project to not only meet their goals but meet the goals of other groups. I want to give also a lot of thanks to the Sizemore family for allowing me to use their livestock for grazing this project and even at times that may can inconvenience them and may not be a definitely is not a financial goal of theirs because it's not involved and I want to last but not least also thank my wife and daughter Sherry and Caitlin for allowing me to come up here work all hours of the night and day to be able to do work on a wonderful project like this so thank you. <laughs>